where they had training tables and psychiatrists. And they used to bring Prozac in. Let me turn this tape off. Oh, Michael Trump. I'm up here talking to myself, but I'm not psychotic, I assure you. <laughs> I'll put you up here. All right. All right. So this breakout session is supposed to be done at 3.15, right? So let's move. All right. So let me ask you, all right, in your dealings with your patients, have you ever had the experience of talking to a drug addict or someone and saying, I cannot, for the life of me, understand why you do that? Nobody's had that experience? Most of you have, okay. All right, I'm gonna tell you a story from my residency, okay? So I'm a green resident at Yale, and I'm out there seeing these patients on a psychiatric unit, and they live on the psychiatric unit for a long time. It was back in the days when we had 30, 60, 90 day length of stays. And one of my patients was a chronic schizophrenic named George. Well, every day, all of us would troop down to the cafeteria at lunchtime, and staff was encouraged to eat with the patients and stuff like that. So George is in line ahead of me. George is walking along the line, filling his tray, and he gets to the dessert part. George sort of gives the old fishy eyeball each way, picks up two cookies, and slips them into his pants. Okay, well, I can confront George right there in the dining room and say, what are you doing with cookies in your underwear, okay? But I chose to wait till we went upstairs and I said, you know, George, what are you doing? Why, why would you ever do that? So he proceeded to explain to me. First, they don't allow snacks in the hospital on the floors because they get vermin. Okay, perfectly reasonable. Second, they bring snacks up to the patients every evening, but they never bring enough, and some of the bigger guys steal the snacks from the littler guys. Okay, I'm getting three cookies, you're not getting any. So what George tells me is he has to bring his own snacks upstairs. So I say, okay, I got it, I got it. But why in your underwear. He said, because I figured when I take them out and my roommate sees me take them out and put them on the nightstand, he never steals them. <laughs> okay, true story, all right? So from my point of view, I'm looking at George in the line and I'm thinking, George is crazy. Okay, no, perfectly logical. And we're gonna see that in some of the stuff about the substance abuse. Now. We're gonna talk about three main things. What's out there, how do you spot it, and what the heck can you do about it if you spot it, okay? All right, note the date up at the top, 1887, the year before Jack the Ripper, all right? This is an advertisement for Mrs. Winslow's Soothing Syrup. Mrs. Winslow's Soothing Syrup, for children teething, is uh, a fruit flavored syrup that has a little bit of alcohol in it and 65 milligrams of morphine per fluid ounce, okay? So it was to comfort small children if they were teething, you'd give them a little bit of Mrs. Winslow's, they'd shut up, all right? Now if you look at this, I was just looking at this last night and I noticed, first of all, the mother is dangling Mrs. Winslow's syrup up there, okay? All right, she's probably had half the bottle herself. Look at her pupils, all right? Second thing is the kids hocked his diaper to pay for Mrs. Winslow's, okay? This is a prototype for addiction. How could they sell 65 milligram per ounce morphine? It wasn't regulated, okay? So, 1887. Next, we go to the early 1900s, this is 1912. Bayer, the people that made aspirin, okay, 
set their business model on four main drugs. Aspirin, they never trademarked the name, so they lost that struggle. Everybody calls every ASA aspirin now. Heroin, lysitol, and salifin. Now, heroin was the sedative for coughs. I can pretty much attest from talking to my active heroin addicts that when they are high, they don't cough, okay? It's a good cough syrup, but there were problems that emerged and it wasn't regulated. It was not till 1923 in the United States that you couldn't buy some of this stuff over the counter or with a prescription, or now. Okay, so the learning objectives are we want to identify what drugs are out there now, what's coming along, their hazards, some research about new methods to screen, refer to treatment, and some new interventions, some pharmacologic and some not. I have no disclosures, by the way, but I will talk about an off-label use of a medication. Okay, so new drugs of abuse. We've got bath salts, K2, molly, and crocodile. Have, has anybody heard of these? Okay, okay. So I'm going to show you a short video. I will tell you at one point there is one slide which is not included in your handouts, which is graphic and horrific, and I will warn you so that you can close your eyes if you wish, okay? That guarantees no one's gonna close their eyes for this, okay. All right, let's start with bath salts. Let's see if I can do this. Randy, by the way, has been, oh my gosh, I wanna take Randy back to Carillion with us. Yeah, after it works. <laughs> it's not working, Randy. There you go. Randy, forget that bus ticket. Okay, if you can do that, thank you. No. Go back. Let's do it it's again. Right, it's right there. Just a second. All right. It's right there. There it is. All right. This is police video of someone who's using bath salts. Okay. And it goes on. Okay. Now, did anybody make out what he said? You can't because it's incoherent. All right. This is a deep level psychosis triggered by bath salts. All right. So let's talk. Oops. Now I triggered the bath salts again. All right. Let's go back to the slides. All right. What are bath salts? Well, they're one of a bunch of chemicals with several effects, and we'll go into the details in a moment. At the time that they first hit the news back in 2010, 2011, I talked to my 17-year-old daughter, whom I rely on to let me know at the time who's using what in high school, okay? And said, you know, uh, Siobhan, Noticed you spend a lot of time at the Bath and Body Works over at the mall. Uh, are you using bath salts? She, of course, rolls her eyes. She has the eye rolling down very well. And said, no, that's, uh, bath salts are from a drug from Africa. All right? And she was absolutely right. All right? The chemical structure of these drugs are similar to ecstasy. Okay? They were sold over the counter legally in most states until fairly recently, within the past year, they are now illegal in all 50 states. Now, the packages were labeled bath salts, rose food, insect repellent, and every package was labeled not for human consumption. 
That's to get around a law from 2003 that says uh, if things are labeled not for human consumption, it makes it harder to prosecute people about them. Okay. The other thing is that they are inexpensive compared to methamphetamine, ecstasy, or cocaine. All right? So we're going to come back to George, rational behavior. If I can get high for six bucks instead of 60 bucks, why not? Okay? Has a much longer high than ecstasy does. So from a bath salt user's perspective, what's positive about it is euphoria, hallucinations, and increased energy. There are two drugs involved in bath salts by and large. One is methylene dioxypyrovalerone, which for obvious reasons we call MDPV, and the other one is methadrone, all right? The average human dose to get high of methadrone is 20 milligrams, all right? So they're sold in 500 milligram packets. The absorption is such that you don't begin to feel the high for 30 minutes. So here's how they use it. You go out, you buy your package of bath salts, and you take some. You can snort it, you can smoke it, or you can uh, shoot it if you're really crazy, or you can swallow it, okay? So you take your bath salts, 15 minutes later you say, geez, this is a dud, I'm gonna take some more. Okay, you start feeling a little bit because you're approaching the 30 minutes from the initial dose, and you say, I'm feeling a little bit, but not very much, so you take it all. So essentially you take 25 times the human dose, which is what this gentleman did, okay? All right. The negative results are hallucinations, agitation, terror, pan paranoia, on autonomic arousal, decreased pain, and suicidality. The medical complication risk from bath salt abuse is very high, usually trauma. Okay, we had one gentleman who decided that he was escaping people that were pursuing him, and he stepped off the fourth floor of a parking garage, okay? He survived, all right? He was on psychiatry, we treated him, he was saying, my gosh, I'll never ever do that again. Three weeks later, he was back with a bath salt high. This time, um, he was in a wheelchair, uh, but he said, I, you know, I thought that was just a bad batch. Okay, bath salts are cathinone analogs. Well, what is a cathinone, okay? Cathinone is a chemical that comes from a product named CAT, K-H-A-T. Has anyone heard of it? Yeah, okay. CAT is a shrub that grows in the eastern part of Africa. CAT is chewed swallowed, may be mixed with food, may be smoked. Has mildly stimulating effects, mild uh, uh, euphoria effects. It's not unlike, in some ways, coca leaves. Okay, so in the Andes, people chew coca leaves. They get a mild high. It can be addictive, so they chew all day long, but they're generally not out knocking over 7-Elevens when they're chewing coca leaves. When you change the route of administration, refine the drug, smoke it, shoot it, eat it, snort it, you change the effects. Okay. All right, I'm going to skip over this so I can get you folks out on time. All right, previously, cot was primarily abused in Europe and Africa, uh, Australia. Um, so, when did cot begin being used in the United States? Well, there was this little thing about 25 years ago in Somalia where there was a huge civil war and total collapse of the societal norms and warring warlords. And we sent troops over there. Remember Black Hawk Down? Okay. And we brought refugees back. 
And some of our troops were using cot. Some of our refugees were using cot, not all of them. And it started to catch on in the United States. It's just really taken off in the past five years or so. OK. So bath salts, exposure calls. All right, a couple things about this. Notice the scale on the left. The peak over there is around 750 calls per month for the American Association of Poison Control Centers. OK? And the peak is in the summer. Drug abuse patterns generally peak in the summer. It's like ice cream sales, probably for similar reasons. And probably for infectious disease reasons, um, infectious disease tend to peak in the winter when people are closer together. OK? So let's look at 2012. Oh, another peak in the summer, but not nearly as high. 2013, pretty level. Now think about this as though it were an infectious agent. We have a naive population in 2011 where no one has ever been exposed to this infectious agent, all right? Population is, is exposed. A certain percentage of the population is vulnerable and develops a major problem with it. That's the initial peak. That population experiences the adverse effects, goes away, and then about a year later, you have a resurgence of people that had not previously been exposed, but were not around at the time. This second peak is largely people that were incarcerated during the first exposure, okay? Word on the street is now, don't even go there with it, which is why we have the low um, flat curve. But look at the flat curve. There are still 100 calls per month. OK? Now, what about K2, spice, and all of the other synthetic marijuanas? Once again, it's an attempt to get around DEA classifications regarding abusable drugs. They claim that they're natural, that they're just herbal, they're sold under the name of herbal incense, and so on. They're actually herbs that are not psychoactive themselves, but they're sprayed with THC analogs. All right, and if you look at this, I'm not sure how, it, is this a pointer? Okay, if you look at this, the chemical structures are very, very similar, except the HU210 is approximately 500 times as potent as THC. So where you see this is you will get a dry addict who said, I've been smoking a lot of pot my whole life, but now it makes me itchy, I'm throwing up, I have to take constant showers, all right? They're getting the synthetic marijuana. The synthetic marijuana is now illegal in all states pretty much also. I think it's all states. Um, one of the things that we're seeing a decrease, one of the reasons that we're seeing a decrease in the synthetic marijuana is because um, of the legalization of marijuana. The last drug I want to talk about is crocodile, okay? Crocodile is Russian for crocodile. The drug is named because of the scaly effect on the skin that the people who abuse it get. Now, if you look at this, if this right here were a hydroxy group like this one instead of just a hydrogen, it would be morphine, okay? This is heroin, it's diacetylmorphine, so instead of two hydroxy groups at those sites, it has acetyl groups. This is desomorphine, or morphine with an, a, um, an oxy removed. It's got a hydrogen there instead of an oxy, okay? Crocodile is desomorphine, all right? In analgesic effect, it's 10 times as potent as morphine. It's 15 times more potent in respiratory depression. It's three times more toxic. And the person is less likely to develop tolerance to the high effects, okay? 
and it has a much shorter high, an hour and a half as opposed to four hours. So people dose more frequently. Okay. Now, here's how you synthesize it. You start with codeine, and you use an extraction method that is very similar to the extraction method to make methamphetamine from pseudoephedrine. Okay? So instead of pseudoephed, you're starting with codeine. And codeine, as you know, is not as potent in general as morphine is. It's broken down into your body into morphine, which is the active component. So you've changed it from something weaker than morphine to something about 10 times more potent, 10 to 15 times more potent, OK? The extraction method, if it's controlled, is very safe. But drug addicts are not known for their quality control regularity while they're synthesizing drugs. All right, there's the slide. OK, sorry, I didn't warn you to close your arms. This is what happens when you inject kerosene or gasoline and white phosphorus and whatever into your arm. You get necrosis, OK? I showed this to a surgeon who said, that is a very well debrided wound. We see different things when we look at slides. All right? So the question becomes, why would anyone ever do this to themselves? You see one of your friends like this, and you say, I'm never going to touch this stuff. And you would do, say that if you were a rational actor. There are 100,000 active users of crocodile or crocodile in Russia, 20,000 in the Ukraine, an unknown number in South Africa. All right? Um, we don't know because they didn't count in South Africa. Okay? And as of last Tuesday, you can buy it on the internet. I checked. Okay? There were two cases in September of this year in Arizona, five in October, and it's less likely to spread. So why is it prevalent in Eurasia and Africa and not here? Codeine's over the counter in Russia and the Ukraine. So you can go in and you can buy 40 co uh, codeine tablets. You can take them home and you can make crocodile. Okay? Codeine is not over the counter here, but on the other hand, this is a very cost effective alternative to heroin. It is much cheaper than heroin. It's about a quarter of the price. All right? So you can't get your heroin. This is available. You're going to use it. So why would anyone do this? And this segues into the second section of the talk, okay? First of all, vulnerable populations perceive less risk. So let me, have you guys heard about the marshmallow experiment? All right, here it is. It's done in the 1960s. I'm a four-year-old kid. The experimenter brings me into a room, okay? And this is the 60s where marshmallows meant something, okay? sits me down at the table, puts a marshmallow on a plate in front of me, and says, I'm leaving the room for 15 minutes. If that, that is your marshmallow, OK? If it's still here when I come back in 15 minutes, you will get another marshmallow with it. You'll have two. If it's not here, hey, no harm, no foul. You ate your marshmallow, all right? So about 15 to 20% of kids Eat the marshmallow, all right? What's interesting is that if you track those kids for the next 20 years, they have a much higher incidence of drug abuse. They have a much higher incidence of criminal convictions, truancy from school, and teen pregnancies, father or mother, OK? These are kids that are, have difficulty projecting consequences into the future. Now, we can train people to be better at that. And one of our researchers at Virginia Tech Carillion is Warren Bickle. And his research is very much about that. So one of the things that you can do is you can test. One of his experiments is, OK, you're my experimental subject. 
you've just earned $100. However, if you hold off and don't collect it today and come back in the future, okay, we'll give you 150 all right? So any human being, me included, puts a time limit on that. If he says 10 years, I'm like, oh, sorry, Warren, I want the cash now, okay? Because 10 years, it makes no sense. What if Warren dies? I can't trust his partner to give it to me, okay? What if the economy collapses? So for the average adult American, the discounting period for that is between two and three weeks, all right? After that, I'm equally likely to say, no, give me the 100 now, all right? For addicts, the discounting period is 72 hours, okay? But you can train them to discount longer by changing the rewards. And I'm not gonna get in that today. That's beyond, that's a whole topic in itself. But it's leading us to new ways to intervene. All right, so screening. There are a bunch of screenings, uh, screening concerns in um, non-psychiatric settings. First of all, it's uncomfortable to say, as I did to my daughter, are you doing bath salts, okay? Second, it takes time to do it. Although it can be a very short period of time, it still takes time. But the biggest thing is, okay, what do I do if they say, yeah, I'm doing a drug? Okay, now one of the things that's most interesting, if you're not familiar with the Monitoring the Future Project, it's a federally funded study that's been going on for 30 years. And this is the one that puts in your local, local newspaper, 40% of high school seniors have used marijuana, okay? So their website has all the raw data that you can look at. This slide I find very interesting because this combines use in the past year, that's the blue, with perceived risk. How harmful it is to use this drug. If you look at the red, the perceived risk, during times when the risk was low, as far as the high school students saw it, they used a lot more. And these two curves the red precedes the blue by about a year. So you can actually control drug use by perceived risk, which is one of the reasons that the bath salt epidemic extinguished relatively rapidly, because you couldn't watch TV without watching stuff about bath salt zombies and all sorts of stuff. All right, so there, on your handout, there is a link to a video, series of videos at Yale, which show you how to do a screening, brief intervention, and referral to therapy. Um, we train the medical students to do this. This is an intervention that takes five to six minutes. It's not a huge, long intervention. The screening will often involve um, administration of a questionnaire, that's also in your handouts, the, uh, the audit or alcohol use disorders identification test. By the way, the audit is um, uh, public domain and you can use it freely, okay? So the questions are, how often do you have a drink containing alcohol, four or more times a week maybe, okay? How many drinks do you drink a day? We heard from Dr. Basil this morning that perhaps I shouldn't have been going around collecting tickets from everyone at the reception last night so that I could drink all of their drinks, okay? And how often do you have six or more drinks on one occasion? This is a very easy screening tool. We have this in the form that it's self-administered. The patient completes, when they come in, they get handed the audit, they fill it out, hand it to the doctor when they see them, okay? okay? And what you then do is you determine if you think it's harmful, instead of saying, don't you think you should cut back? You say something about, gee, that's interesting. Is, has, has that ever caused you any problems? All right, so it's a less aggressive way. 
And we talked about this briefly, but what we do is start to use a model of gradual change so that over several interventions, we get the person to come up with a plan to reduce or stop their drinking or drug use. Okay. All right, new medication interventions, I'm going to talk about two. The first is for alcohol abuse, it's topiramate, Topamax. As you know, Topamax was developed as an anti-epileptic drug, all right? Um, psychiatrists are pack rats. If we can find any use psychiatrically for a drug, we will. If we could find a psychiatric use for penicillin, I can guarantee that some of our patients would be on penicillin. So when it came out, we noticed that some people with comorbid epilepsy and bipolar disorder actually got a little bit better with respect to the bipolar. So we started looking at that. We also noticed that with people that were on some of the atypical antipsychotics, which are prone to have massive weight gain and lipid problems associated with it, started to lose weight on Topamax. So Topamax is now in um, stage three clinical testing for indications for both of those things. In terms of alcohol, there's a doctor at University of Virginia, chair of their psychiatry department, Ben Coley Johnson. He took alcoholics with an average daily drink of 15 standard drinks. So 15 shots of booze, okay? 15 beers, 15 glasses of wine, 15, all right? Half of them we gave, he gave placebo, half of them he gave topiramate, 50 to 100 milligrams a day, and he said, go forth and drink as much as you want, all right? Placebo group cut their drinking from an average of 15 down to about 11, just placebo effect. The topiramate group cut them down to about five. So there is pretty strong evidence that topiramate seems to curb some of the conversion of craving into behavior to satisfy the craving. We're not sure if it affects craving yet. And then the last thing I want to talk about is the use of buprenorphine for opioid maintenance. Controlled Substance Act of 1970, the one that gave us the DEA, okay, is the one that classified methadone for treatment of addiction as able to be administered or prescribed only in a methadone clinic. So if you're treating someone for chronic severe pain, you're perfectly able to prescribe methadone for them because that's their indication. If you, somebody comes in and says, I've got this, uh, this dilaudid addiction, can't you please prescribe some methadone for me to detox? You can't do that. They have, they have to go through a methadone clinic. Well, methadone clinics are very useful except for two things. Number one, there aren't that many of them and nobody wants them in their neighborhood, okay? And number two, their orientation is toward opioid maintenance therapy. So once they're on the methadone, they may be on the methadone for 10 years with no attempt to get them off. So in 2002, buprenorphine, which is a partial agonist, was approved for use in detoxification and maintenance. Any physician can take the course, which is available online for about 100 bucks. We do it for free for our attendings and residents. All, every resident is expected to be buprenorphine certified by the time of graduation. And it's about a six to eight hour course. It's very easy to do. Once you get it, you go to the website that's in your handouts and you fill out the form for the waiver and you can then prescribe it. Now, some physicians say, I don't want to deal with addicts in my practice. Well, um, you're probably already dealing with them. They're just studying the books the night before to make sure that they give you the right symptoms so that you'll give them the hydrocodone. Okay? All right. Now, one final thing about that. Let's talk about interdiction and law enforcement efforts to reduce drug addiction. 
Western Virginia, okay, the western half of the state, okay, roughly from just west of Charlottesville over, is the Western Medical Examiner's District. So some of you will remember the big OxyContin epidemic about a decade ago. Um, everybody in that area was preferentially using OxyContin, okay? The drug addicts. So in terms of unintentional overdose death, the combination in 2003 that killed the most people in Western, West, Western Virginia was hands down oxycodone, the, co the component of oxycontin, and Xanax, okay? So you mix a benzo and an opioid, you're in big trouble, okay? So these were not people attempting suicide, they were just pursuing the high, riding the dragon, okay? So, clamp down real hard on it, investigate those physicians who are prescribing it, put in sanctions, send some people to jail, and by 2009, there were almost no deaths from Xanax and OxyContin together. Instead, there were pretty much exactly the same number of deaths, actually there were a few more, from the combination of hydrocodone and clonopin, okay? Nowadays, we're seeing a little bit less of that because the drug cartels have established a distribution chain through Roanoke out of Baltimore with heroin. So we're seeing a lot more heroin now. You can't legislate biology. So that's one of the problems we have in the public health arena. All right, I'm gonna stop now. Anybody who has questions for any of the three panelists Please feel free to stay and ask us. Anybody who wants to leave and walk in the rain or join the Mamba party upstairs, go right ahead. They're stomping around out there. <laughs>